Uh, Frederick Mann, who's typically my co-moderator, is under the weather, so we can take some time to just send him some good healing vibes. Feel free to use the chat box on the right to let us know, um, maybe drop in where you're from or a word of how you're feeling. Our team at TRF is um, always tuning in with you and we'll be taking time to actually share your comments after each discussion question. So please feel free to be sharing alongside with us as we discuss each question. And a quick note is if you find that you're unable to comment, just make sure that you're subscribed to the YouTube channel and that should open up your ability to do so. So before we start, I will just tell you a little bit about TRF. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to supporting and growing a community of clinicians, researchers, educators, and people whose lives are affected by trauma. Today's session, we are in the second episode of a four-part series where we are featuring the book, The Politics of Trauma, Somatics, Healing, and Social Justice by Stacey K. Hines. And during the final episode, which will take place two weeks or three weeks from now, accounting the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, which will be on December 1st, Stacey herself will come and join us for a live Q&A session. We typically invite as many as 15 panelists up with us from our community to come and share and participate in discussion. They are invited from anywhere around the world and from every background. We really work on welcoming a variety and diverse um, set of voices to come up and share their experiences and thoughts. So if you are watching and you want to come and join in on the conversation with us with one of these panelists, please feel free to apply. You can find the application on our website. And um, we also do always offer a study guide as a companion to your reading and you can find that as well on our website to download. Before we kick off, I just want to give a shout out, of course, to the Trauma Research Foundation team that makes this entire production possible. Pat is here, who's our wonderful media manager, always making sure things go off well. Uh, Emma is our program specialist, and we have actually a couple of TRF team members who are coming on as panelists today, Liz and Star. And of course, uh, Laura is here with us, who's our program manager. And, um, a note for everyone as well before we get started is to make sure you take care of yourself. The uh, nature of our conversation being around trauma means that things may come up for you and some of the topics might be difficult. So some just suggestions that we have is taking a pause when you need to, getting up and getting a drink of water, maybe taking a stretch or do some deep breaths. Um, another good thing that I really like is crossing my hands here and doing some bilateral butterfly taps on my chest, which just helps me to regulate the nervous system. And with that, I will open it up to our first question. And let me go ahead and share that with you all now. Okay, so our first question, how can we transform even while still being in the system, family, or community that is oppressing or traumatizing us? So I'll read that one again. How can we transform even while still being in the system, family, or community that is oppressing or traumatizing us? Karen. Saw your hand up first. Um, just make sure you are unmuted. Sorry about that. So this is actually one of my favorite questions, anything regarding transformation, because I'm a transformation coach. And it's a beautiful question because there is always something that we can do on our own to transform our lives. Step number one is really getting to know what our values are. When we know our values, that gives us direction on where we want to um, end up. And so once you identify your values, asking yourself what you can do as a person to get there, you know, making that plan, 
building that dream, visualizing yourself there. That to me is the beginning steps of transformation. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, that piece around, um, I love the healing path because so much of it comes back to our own agency and sovereignty and remembering our place and ability to act. Feels quite empowering. Nicole. I, um, so I think the chap the book's chapter on generating safety was helpful um, for this question where, for instance, on page 218, it says, our aim in regenerating safety is to rebuild an internal sense of safety, boundaries, and consent. And I think that um, for adults, um, generally speaking, there is a way to create boundaries and hopefully to build um, consent and help basically carve out a, a an area, a space of safety, even if there is still um, trauma and oppression around you. Um, and from there, trying to build relationships and ideally community and making choices so that you can actually build your internal and external resources of support um, and then be able to do that transformative work that um, somatics describes. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you is we still have this ability to work on working with boundaries to create a way for us to understand our own internal and safety. And even in those conditions, regardless of whether or not we're still actually in maybe an oppressive situation, but even in that, we are able to work within some framework of creating safety for ourselves. Yeah. Star. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, for, I guess, for me in this question, I would look at or um, look at the current state of where we're at. We're in a, in a state of cancel culture. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're thinking about a lot of the systems that um, are currently in place, they have been systems of oppression. And you see a lot of movements um, that are actually focused on destroying those systems. Um, so keeping yourself safe in those spaces and places is finding camaraderie, finding, finding allies, as well as working on self to identify your own um, biases, or, um, you know, those the, how trauma has affected you to move forward and kind of using your voice, I would say not kind of, but using your voice to um, be effective in the change that you desire. Um, so um, I could keep going on that, but that's all I have to add. Thanks, Star. Yeah, first part of voice. Actually, that's really great because it, um, one, uh, I'll go over to Holly, but it, it'll foreshadow into one of the next questions, which is talking about declarations and that part of voice. And why is it that making these declarations that Stacey talks about is a really big piece of um, beginning the somatics work? Holly? I'm going to dovetail right off Star's good words uh, and talk about just the power of allyship and surrounding yourself with allies so that your soma can relax and know for that time you're surrounded by people who see you and see your wholeness and support your agency to even make a declaration um and will affirm that for you so just to be concrete some of the circles that i work in and the work that i do would be um, gay straight alliances at school so these are like safe havens in a place where you know, people can be seen and um, the the culture may differ in other ways, but in, in that space and time, they're creating those situations where they can feel their soma and they can feel their longings and really claim them. Yeah. I like the theme of everyone's responses just um, gives a lot of hope, you know, even in the current world that we're in today, it can feel hopeless. It can feel that there that we look out and there are all these ways that we're being oppressed all around us, but knowing there's ways for us to work with our soma and find that sense of safety 
and that that is where the healing can happen is, um, yeah, it feels really, really hopeful in our times today. Ronnie? Yeah, I agree with what everybody said. I think that to add on top of it, in addition to the, um, the SOMA and the things that we find in community, it's also very important to have a strong spiritual core. Um, being able to have a identity that transcends our bodies, uh, as important as it is, is something that a lot of people around the world actually experiences. And I think a lot about what's going on in, um, let's say, Ukraine right now. And yeah, definitely a lot of people have to um, find camaraderie among the other people that are there. But sometimes you're trapped there by yourself. And how do you move beyond what is going on around you? Uh, do you still have a sense of how do you see perspective? Uh, you think about Viktor Frankl and, uh, you know, back when he was in the concentration camp. So just having that strong core, I think is very important. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, and it reminds me, there was one study that Stacey talked about. Um, I mean, this we're going to get into this part, but talking about resiliency and how is it that even when we go through times of trauma, um, how can we kind of return to that centeredness? Susan? Um, yeah, I think that one of the things that um, stands out for me in the book is, is the whole idea of scale. And if we, if we do this kind of work, um, what, you know, and I, I'm sort of not, not trying to jump ahead and preempt, but with the idea of resiliency, what we always get is this opening up of multiple pathways. And if we're in our um, in our patterning, we kind of keep our bodies, our somas respond in the same way again and again. And to be in a, a situation, and she's always saying under pressure, like we're in when we're in a situation um, and under pressure, we, we're, we're probably going to default to the uh, iterative practices that we do again and again and again. And this kind of whole idea of opening different pathways so we have different options different ways out i mean that's that seems to be the best way towards social transformation because other words we're uh, we're in action reaction action reaction and and you know it, it keeps us kind of in oppositional mode instead of having multiple pathways um to navigate through and that the importance of engaging complexity that um she that she raises again and again yeah you know, I think one of the one, this isn't um, a Stacy quote, it's a Gabor Mate quote, but it was so um, enlightening to me when he said trauma isn't what happened, what happened to you. It's how your system responded. And what feels so exciting about especially this work with Stacy is it really brings it into the nuances of what's going on in our system and really understanding okay, here were all the previous patterns that were there and created in order to help us survive. And now how do we build new systems and how do we kind of work within our own body in order to find and understand safety and belonging and, and dignity. But again, it, it goes back to this ability for, um, even if we are still in a system family or community that's suppressing, that's suppressing us, we have so much to uh, work with still. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you all so much for opening um, opening that up. It felt like a really great question for us to start with. And um, I'll pop into our virtual audience for a moment before moving on to the next question. So Janine joined us and says, I transform my pain into a catalyst for powerful change. I go inside myself and start to heal and move my body through music, dance, and singing. I also dedicate myself to morning journaling and gratitude practice. Thank you, Janine. Yeah, that that uh, I like that. I like that. That really Stacy gets into that about resiliency as well. Um, before the next question, do any of our panelists want to share any of their practices that that you all do? Um, I, when I was a kid, I would play the piano and it was my way of creating a space in an otherwise like sort of stressful, um, dysfunctional environment. And, uh, and it, and I'm pretty sure like, so music sort of kept me alive. Yeah. Ronnie. 
Yeah, again, I think from a from a spiritual perspective, prayer is very important. Um, and even when when we learn in uh, TRF, uh, the trauma stress studies talks a lot about heart rate variability, right? So chanting, beating the drums, a lot of things. Uh, I actually, my spiritual home is in Africa, and we do a lot of drumming, uh, okay. and it just invigorates the system. Um, it's a it's a clarion call for uh, spiritual warfare and battle. Uh, so whether you're out there in the front lines of a real war or uh, oppression in your home, that's something we we advise. And it works with infants even. It's very, very well done. Mm. Awesome. Just take um, one more and then move on to the question. Uh, Holly? I would have to say a continuum of some of the practices that have been mentioned, and including just soma practices of yoga, qigong, um, combining that with journaling, but not separate from joining a book group, book group like this. Um, mm -hmm. So not siloing it to just to myself. It's this expansive compassion that um, my meditation then leads me to want to be part of groups and take action. And that, that feeds my resilience. Mm -hmm. It feeds my my sense of hope for the greater whole to continue the work. Thanks, Holly. So moving on to our next question. Why is actively pursuing social justice important for individual healing and transformation? Why is actively pursuing social justice important for individual healing and transformation? I saw Susan's hand come up. Susan. Well, I, I think, you know, what comes through so strongly in the book is, is uh, building a uh, stronger and stronger sense of interconnection. And if we um, sit on a meditation uh, uh, cushion or do yoga practice or whatever, only in isolation, um, it, we can do so much. I mean, it's back to the what I was saying in the last section about uh, under pressure. I mean, we, we can do all kinds of healing individually, and then we go out into a world that is structured by trauma. Um, and so if we're not do, translating what we're what we're doing individually into the, the larger sphere, I mean, it's kind of hopeless just doing the individual work. Um, but but being able to move it forward um, is, it, 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 you know, is so important. And I think that's kind of the hinge of the argument, you know, the central argument of the book is that, that, that people in healing modalities need to kind of have a social analysis and do social justice work and vice versa and it's it's that kind of hinge that's um that, that's so important for transformation hmm. yeah i i think you're so right that one of the um things that i really remark about with this book is how much she's really able to go from the individual to the collective and the individual to the collective and connect just how much they are interwoven, you know, like something as simple as like, we can't talk about uh, healing children without talking about all the systems that oppress them. We can't talk about, you know, working with the trauma that comes to women without talking about everything that happens in our society that actually goes to oppress them. And um, I feel like with that too, it, it really weaves into her, her, she always asked that question for the sake of what? <laughs> So I, I feel like, you know, this bigger picture for her is like for the sake of what? Well, it's for us and it's for the collective um, and really being able to lay out in a book how those, um, how those interweave together is, I feel like it's her writing is just masterful with that. Uh, Karen. Yeah, so I think the key word in that question is active. A lot of my clients can, and myself included, I have a personal history of trauma. We can get really stuck in our pain um, and like, okay, what do I do next? What do I do next? When we look at what could move the needle, we always think of these big things, like maybe go into protest. And some people, based on any um, disabilities they have or just, being too far away, um, that may not be an option for them. So I, I always get encourage them to look at smaller things that they can do 
to show that they support social justice initiatives. Like, is there a small donation you can give to a shelter? Or can you make small gift bags? Can you go and volunteer somewhere? And just looking at the different elements of what it means to be a social justice advocate is very empowering, both collectively and as an individual. So that's one of the things I work with my clients on quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for your work. Uh, Maria? Hello. Um, so I was thinking as everyone was talking and, um, you know, we can all work on ourselves. It's amazing. It's great. But how do we, can you hear me? Maria? Yeah, I think, um, I think there might be some background noise. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm not sure how to adjust that. Is there some sound playing on a different browser or tab for you? No, I think it must be on my computer. Is it too noisy? Then I'll just, I don't know, I try to. Uh, uh, maybe um, see if you can find where that is and turn it off. Um, we'll call in Nicole for now. Yeah. Oh, it actually sounds like it's gone away. Yeah, looks like it's cleared. Oh, it, it did? <laughs> Okay. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. If it comes back on, let me know. So I'll just make it quick before it comes back on. I just want to say basically, yes, we can all work on ourselves, but how do we really know what's working, what's not working until you are in a relationship or you are in connection with others? And so how do we know that we're making an impact, we're making a change until we are in a community? Um, so... To me, that's why it's vital for us to not only do the work ourselves, but to connect with others and to continue to um, share and grow and, you know, try to impact what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nicole. So I think one of the best parts of this book is the way in which um, the author describes how trauma is, um, as she says, training and oppression, and how she describes um, systemic trauma on like page 80 as the repeated ongoing violation, exploitation, dismissal of, and or deprivation of groups of people. It's just so wise and deep um, to realize that. And I think that as someone who is like, experienced trauma herself um, and realizing that it wasn't just an isolated thing, but really reflective of many oppressive and um, structural um, problems and social norms in our society. Um, I think it's just so, it's so thrilling to have a, a, an author like recognize that, but in my own personal journey, <clears throat> Um, for me to not feel like I was just a victim, but actually realize I had a valuable experience that has taught me something that from which I can give to society. Um, it was super important for me to work for social justice because when I could um, translate my trauma and how I felt about it into energy and knowledge to improve other people's lives, um, then that's when it became not just a, a victimization, but something that I could turn into good. So yeah, it's really important for me to work for social justice because it it heals me. Yeah, I love that. The, the um, purpose, the purpose piece and being able to go from that really, um, that arc that we find from victim to empowered uh, and being choiceful. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't think their feeling connection to your purpose is one of the most healing things that can happen. Um, so thank you for sharing that part of your journey. Ronnie. Yeah, I mean, I actually found that quote, um such a strong reminder um and, and the words repeated and ongoing deprivation really hit me hard because 
whenever I, uh, you know, whether it's in my own personal experience or with my clients, I see it as almost a, um, uh, a, a conveyor belt of, of people just being placed on there and we're having the same mold slapped onto us. And one of us just has to come along and break the mold. Um, and, and that is the, uh, you know, purpose is a good word for it before it used. Uh, I, I like to use the word meaning quite a bit. Um, when you actually see something happening, not to you, but giving you an opportunity to break that mold, that can be the most empowering thing. Uh, it, it gives you a reason for not only existing, but actually being fully alive and seeing that as a major success. So yeah, just just uh, reappraising that is uh, a big step. Hmm. I like you tying that to um, feeling alive and how Stacy really talks a lot about how a lot of this work is like bringing life back into our bodies <laughs> and that doing this work is life-giving. And um, I think what's, what's miraculous is oftentimes I do find on when people are healing from trauma, when they get their life back, all they want to do is give life to others and become a healing force within themselves. And that's something that is, is definitely beautiful about the social justice movement. You come into people who are um, so life-giving with others. Okay, we'll take one more and move on. Maria. I'm sorry, I forgot to, to lower the hand. I already went, sorry. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. Well, how about we check in with our virtual audience and see what they're saying with us. So we have Jason joining us and saying, it is discouraging that there is pushback when focusing on the collective, especially in American culture. Hmm, interesting. It's discouraging that there's pushback when focusing on the collective. I'd be so curious to know um, where, where we see that. Uh, and Joanna shares with us, since we are social creatures, we heal in the social context and the larger and the larger that circle can become, the more impact of change we have, right? Mm -hmm. So healing in the social context and the larger that circle becomes, the more impact of change we have. Wonderful. Okay, let's um, move on to question three. How is making declarations a we way to heal trauma and drive social change? So how is making declarations a way to heal trauma and drive social change? So this is, I find, one of the fundamental pieces that exists within um, the modality that Stacy works in, this piece about making, making a declaration. And I know when people go through their training, they spend a lot of time really refining what their declaration is and making sure that it is front and center on their computer, people are reminding them and it becomes, you know, this, um, this real statement for them to focus on. Uh, Star. Um, yes, ma'am. So for me, I think when I, when, when you raise this question about de like declaration or declaring new ways of thinking or healing, um, I, I honestly think of um, affirmations. I think about what can I affirm within to impact or work on um, to incorporate truly not just for the moment for but for the rest of my life, right? So I look at um, her arc of, um, what is it? The, I can't even get it out. <laughs> the somatic arc, right? She has so many different points that you can focus on that, um, you know, bit by bit, you can find yourself in the process of change and not even know it. Um, so just by saying, just by de declaring that I'm going to, tomorrow is going to be a different day and do it and actually see it come out in that manner is a beautiful thing. Um, she also, uh, Gosh, I just lost my thought. But she also goes in, into um, helping uh, just that measurement does not have to be um, unrealistic. It can be tomorrow I'm going to speak to two people, new people that I've never spoke to, to before. You know, just making sure that it's something measurable or tangible um, in where we're uh, finding ourselves or the process of change um, within ourselves. So, yes, ma'am. Hmm. Thank you, Star. 
Holly. I too loved how concrete she was with that. What I would like to say is like a narrative change. She talks about the organization she helped to create called Five Generations, you know, ending sexual child abuse within five generations. Well, in order to do that, someone has to make a declaration that their life is going to be transformed. And, you know, she did that. She's a person who's a, a survivor in that way and a thriver. And but it doesn't happen just in this amorphous sort of, I wish this to happen. It happens in a very concrete way by making a declaration that goes against often a familial pattern, a cultural pattern, um, what society thinks of you. And the strength of making that declaration and making it concrete so that when all the pushback comes at you, you're standing in something. And and you you are standing solid and saying no this is this is where I'm where I'm headed. Yeah, thank you. I I think of um, a friend of mine. I think one time wrote, "Hope is not a plan," <laughs> and it really hit me in a place because sometimes you know I think hope is enough. <laughs> and what I what I like about this is it's um. I think I also remember someone saying, you know, the voice is where the mind and the heart meet to come out into the world. And so there is something, <clears throat> as I clear my throat, really beautiful about a declaration being a speech act. And that when we are, I think Stacey says, when, we're, when we declare, we are tending to and finding a future. And that a declaration is an embodied competency so that it, it, it really is something also that we are we're feeling and putting forward and that it it really also feels like it's the you know it's not the first step in the sense that even getting to the de declaration we really have to give space to how much work it takes to even energetically get to that declaration but then the the part of bringing it out into the world and kind of putting that flag in the ground um is such an important piece to to bringing it forward and I love that you said that about the voice, because we don't often think of somatic work as using your voice, but there is mm -hmm. just as much energy in vocalizing as there is in raising our hand. And so it's it's really understated, but it's ex extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even as we think about, I mean, vibration, uh, mm -hmm. we don't have to get into the science of all that, but just the vibrational quality of what us even hearing our own voice within our own bodies in Soma, what does, what does that mean? What does that do to us when we even hear ourselves speaking for our own truth? It makes me think of all the songs that come hmm. from enslaved people who sang to raise vibration against continued oppression and claim declaration in those songs. Mm. Yeah, powerful, really powerful. Susan. Yeah, I, I think, um, I hope at some point we talk about uh, um, the, the, the personal essays throughout the book. I think Prentice Hemphill, I, you know, I, I've been listening to it as an audiobook as well as rereading it. Um, and the first time I read this book, I was so profoundly moved um, by each and every um, essay. And I just thought as a, as a kind of act of life writing, like this process of moving away from conscription conscription, uh, con not conscription, constriction, where you feel that your life trajectory um, is very, very constrained in what it's, you know, what, what possibilities it allows. And then, you know, the way that Prentice Hemphill unpacks all of, the, you know, starts by sort of saying, I wasn't even ready to do this declaration. Like I had to sit with it for such a long time. And then like this richness burst forward and it, you know, it's to echo um, what was just said too about making the, the, the generation five organization, but, but then Prentice Hemphill becomes, uh, you know, very, very profoundly involved in, in Black Lives Matter and bold in all of these organizations as, as well as in a therapeutic practice. And, and like, you know, again, it's these multiple pathways that just open out, but there's something in the writing process 
too, that I don't even know what to say about it, but it's profoundly moving and sort of opening and resonant um, in, in each of these life stories as they're, nar they're narrated, which started at some point from making that kind of declaration and, and not necessarily knowing where it was going to take them. But in each instance, we see how, how, how deep it has taken each speaker and how many paths it's opened up for them. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Susan. <clears throat> it it reminds me, um, there's a part of this question that I I wanted to to put in here. Um, but just a part where she talks about the about the inequitable social conditions and how how does that already influence and impact our ability to make declarations, and that some people are born and are continuously encouraged to imagine futures and that some people are born and discouraged and that oftentimes it's people with privilege who are the best at making these declarations for themselves and, and can practice doing so. And then those who are under systemic uh, conditions that don't allow for privilege have to be reminded to and have to even build and understand the muscle to how to do that. And so even just um, thinking about from the very get-go, how do how do our systems prevent or bring more people to have more privilege just to be able to know how to make a declaration and how can that really impact someone's life from, from there? Ronnie. Yeah, I love this conversation about um, declarations because when you read the book, that in inequitable structure really comes out, right? And and that's a reality we all live in. We're not all privileged. We can't all just, you know, raise our hands and speak when we're in a room full of people uh, and have the same level of respect or or welcome. And I think that's why before when I when I you know you brought the idea of prayer, that's where you start with because you have an audience of one when you're praying, but then slowly over time, it's not supposed to be a solitary event. You actually bring other people, it's a communal activity. And when you speak it out and other people join in with you uh, and you can hear it louder and louder, it becomes it becomes a magnificent thing. You, you think about uh, singer-songwriters, and, and I focus a lot on expressive arts, but singer-songwriters, they pour out their hearts. Uh, all the trauma comes tumbling out and it has a purpose and it becomes a clarion call for, for a lot of folks. So when, when you were 10 years old or 20 years old, you remember those teenage years and you had a song, your favorite song, it, probably because that singer songwriter had a lot of angst that that you that resonated with you. So being able to put that out there um, and have other people hear the same things that you're speaking and maybe even add in their own stories to it uh, is a wonderful process. And and you can even go into other forms of art, so poetry, slam poetry. Um, uh, you know, when you talk about declarations, you have a banner. You can draw together and have a mural. Those have been really wonderful uh, pieces in the community. So just being able to express yourself in artistic ways is a great declaration. Mm, I love that. That's beautiful. You definitely expanded um, the way that I was thinking about declarations. That's great. Um, wonderful. Thank you all for that one, that great discussion. It feels very empowering. I feel like I want to go and draw a big mural now. Um, let's tune in with our online audience. So Joanna, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us. She says, I like the section of declarations and remembered my work as a special education teacher and writing measurable goals with my students who had individual education programs. And she also shared, I love the comments about the vocalizing these declarations aloud. So empowering indeed to hear our own voice. And Jean, uh, Janine was affirming your responses, Ronnie, and saying, amen, music is a universal language and we all understand. <laughs> Great. All right, let's move on to our next question. Thank you all for just being with us on this wonderful topic and reading through this, you know, kind of difficult to read book. And it feels nice to be able to come together and in a group and just distill down some of the topics. And um, I think it's an important part of an integration process when we read books that can be very personal experiences, but then to come together in a community, it feels very completing, at least for me. Okay, so our next question, 
what does resiliency feel like? What resiliency practices do you value most individually or in your community? So what does resiliency feel like? I like this question that tunes us into our bodies so we can not only be in our minds. What does resiliency feel like? What resiliency practices do you value most individually or in your community? So this takes us a moment to even come into our bodies and um, we can take this moment. Stacey cues us with an exercise of where she even tells us to find a time in our life where we felt resilient and what sensations did we feel? She even did this with music when she says people play music. What is it that you feel when you're playing music? Come back to the sensations and really anchor there. Maria. Oh, um, is that okay? I hope it's not too loud. Um, it's not going now, so you sound great. I often think about this, um, you know, especially in my own life, having gone through a lot, like where does that come from? I, and only been recently and with getting more into knowing about somatic that I've really started to feel. So for me, it's such a, an empowering feeling because in that, even though you might have uh, moments that you're questioning, you're doubting yourself or whatever, you can feel empowered when you're in that moment. Like for example, recently I was in a uh, meeting with people that I thought were like way above me. And once I spoke and afterwards speaking to many of the other people, they were all coming up to me and wanting to talk to me. And that just felt really, really empowering. And that showed me I had the resiliency, you know, to overcome the other things that are still there. Mm. Can I ask you um, what sensations you felt when, when you're feeling that? like excited, um, like almost like a tingly feeling, you know, um, happy, um, like powerful, you know, mm. like in kind of calm, I guess, at the same time as being excited, mm. you know. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, something that really struck out to me in this these parts was um how she talks about that we have a we are born with a natural impulse towards this. Um and that we we ha actually have a sense of inherent resilience, this impulse towards uh opening and, and connecting and that we can feel naturally moved, let's just say by nature or even laughter is evidence of this resiliency within ourselves. And so it's um it's beautiful to kind of remember that that we have, we do have this natural pull within us when we're born. Karen. So resiliency for me, it feels like no matter what rocks get flung or thrown at me as an individual, that I will rise above that. That no matter what happens, I will find the strength, whether it's spiritual, a higher power, myself, I will find it and I will come out of the rubble. What it looks like as a community is standing up for people that you, th you see have rocks throwing at them. Uh, a little example would be like when someone has a loss in their family, you know, and they're struggling, be a person that's there during those hard times. And when, especially when other people move on, you know, be that person that's still, you know, connecting them and helping them build their strength back up. And there's lots of different ways to do that. So that's how I think of resiliency. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share um, the second part of the question is what resiliency practices? So 
what might be huh. some practices that you'd offer? Um, well, it comes back to like those self-care practices that as providers, we're always talking about, and it's not just like going to get your nails done, but things that truly restore you and, and are healing. So I like, I like massage a lot. I like yoga doing those things, like calming my inner system makes my outer system stronger. So those are the things I like to do. Thanks. Thank you. Star? Uh, just to continue the conversation, um, I like the fact that she focused, when she asked the question about resilience and re resiliency, she asked us to focus on a um, experience that was not traumatic, right? And so I had to kind of journey, journey through all of my experiences to really see where did I have joy? Where did I find joy in, in, in something? And that was when I, well, I would say for me, it was a conversion into um, Islam for me. And to drive um, Ronnie's point, so prayer five times a day, come on now. The connection to the divine on a daily basis on almost every phase of the, of the sun throughout the day um, is very divine. And so I think of um, resilience, not only being a daily practice such as prayer, but um, how can I continue to, to develop? She also talked about this and I just wanna state this for maybe a second. She stated that um, for certain communities, it can re-offend or you know, reoffend someone um, in the black community. Being called resilient or strong, being a strong black woman, it's hard. That's hard to carry for a long for for myself. I'm going to speak for me. Um, going through poverty, poverty, that poverty mindset, and getting through that is a wonderful thing. But it didn't. It didn't. It didn't take strength to get me there. It took a, being an adult <laughs> to get me out of poverty, right? And so, just um, noticing that that word can offend. Um, certain communities of color. Um, I'm glad that she addressed that in the book. Mm, yeah, thank you. There, there was a piece in there around how can people use resiliency um, in the other direction to, to actually continue systems of oppression. Yeah, and I think you touched upon that. Thank you, Star. Susan. My example is going to sound a bit strange, but... Um... Uh, I teach in, in, in the university level and, and I've been teaching for almost three decades and the, the levels of mental illness that students are struggling with at the moment are just alarming in, in the proportion. And we're all in a system. I mean, here, this is where I think the systemic analysis, we're in a system, including, you know, universities are colonial structures and they the way that they're organized unintentionally probably re-traumatizes all the time. And I was teaching the fabulous Robin Wall Kimmerer and she said, she tells a story about getting her PhD and the elders, uh, her Potawatomi elders say to her, what is an educated person? And she gives a few definitions and they said, well, in our tradition, an educated person is someone who knows their gifts and knows how to give them back to the world. And I've just used that as a kind of mantra and restructured all my pedagogy around that. And instead of this kind of feeling of being in this system, and Kimmerer talks about this in other essays, she sort of says, the economic system we live in tells us that no matter what you do and no matter what you have, it isn't enough because it wants you to keep consuming. And, and um, what if we start from abundance? We are abundant already. And, and, and so that has been kind of, like I've, I've had to look at every single micro, you know, institutional practice and cha change it. But what's happened is this resilience. And I, there were these intelligences that I was missing, but watching the students kind of shift out of this sense of anxiety and I can never do everything that, that is being required of me in this degree to kind of, uh, you know, just kind of joyfully engaging in the things that are meaningful to them. And that has been such a gift to me so that it was, you know, it, it, in a way, I mean, it's, it, I guess it's part of the interdependency in the networks, but I, I started this practice as a kind of pedagogical practice. And I can't say like, I have got so much joy from 
my teaching and my career that that was frankly kind of burning me out um you know from from shifting just around that little you know know your gifts and know how best to give them back to the world which is kind of like writing a re re resolution too in a way thank you susan so nice to feel that energy coming from you um we're gonna move on to the next question Although Holly, you shared something in the Zoom that was really beautiful. I'm wondering if it if you feel okay that I share it. Sure. So Holly wrote, feels like freedom to be me unfettered yet grounded in my hips and feet on the land. My community comes together to sing and dance in nature and to mark rituals with each other, to give us webbing with each other and connection to spirit and earth. Just felt very, very beautiful and tied in some things that Susan and Star were both talking about and creating this beautiful webbing together. Thank you for sharing that. And um, to tune in with some of the people online, Cheryl Nelson joined us to say, as a person with a disability, I also try to speak with others who may not have a voice. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Denise says, being resilient to me means being alive after a lifetime of past and ongoing trauma, no matter what I've lost. They resonate with that. And uh, Veronica shared, resiliency to me is having the confidence or knowing that when challenged or knocked down, I will overcome, bounce back and prevail. Thanks everyone from online tuning in with us and letting us know your thoughts. So let's go ahead to our next question. How is resiliency a tool for healing and creating just loving and sustainable conditions? So still saying res with resiliency, how is it a tool for healing and creating just loving and sustainable conditions? Holly. Let me go back to the simple statement that healed people heal people. You know, so when when one of us does better, all of us does better if we if we have the attitude that we are all connected. And so resiliency really I just, I loved it when the author said that, you know, we are connected to 300 like generations back in our body. And that just so struck with me that um, we know in our bodies when, when there is injustice, we know it. We're either, you know, the oppressor or being oppressed. And we know that in our bodies. And so to move forward, we need to be free. We need to be free in our bodies. And that really is just when people are truly, when she asked people to think about their moments of joy and longing, someone said it in the discussion earlier, all they want to do is give right after it, right? No one wants to, to harm another right after it. And so when it's truly free in our body and, and we're truly educated and tutored in, um, in just really knowing ourselves as connected and interdependent. Beautiful. Yeah, that interdependency. I like hearing that word a lot these days. Well, I say that because, you know, there there can be an isolated movement to, you know, the self-care and we've switched to collective care because we know that self-care can be easy to forget that that we are in a web. We are forever in a web and that, that we are interdependent and we know that in our soma. Mm. Thank you, Holly. Ronnie? Yeah, when, when I think of this question, it it actually um, falls in really nicely with the last question because in the last question, we, we consider what does resiliency feel like? And 
And for me, that answer was what the author talks about being open. And so the tool part of it is, is part of this visual image that I, I got when I was thinking about being open. Uh, because when I think about open, I think about the wind. You know, I think about people who are traumatized. They, they're, they're set up like a fortress. They've got the walls up, they're closed off. And how does it feel to be resilient is to open those doors, open up those gates and let the wind in and out, right? Um, and how is that a tool? Well, when you're on a sailboat, you could have a sail, but if you don't have the wind, <laughs> that's nothing, right? Uh, wind, you know, with the windmills powering electricity, that is the the key ingredient to to any sort of empowerment, any sort of change. Uh, I think about the word windswept, right? Just clearing out all the clutter that's in our hearts, in our minds, in our bodies, and just I don't know, going outside and doing windmills, right? Open if you don't have a fortress, open up your windows, right? And just you know, let it out. Um, open the doors, go outside. And, and and how is that sustainable? Kind of goes back to our last question about, you know, how, what are the practices in community? It is is to take that um that image we have in that TRF logo, right? You have it, it could be might as well be a windmill, right? Because it's it's a rotating figure. You've got all these characters there, um, and they're all waving their arms up high. They're open. They're uninhibited, and it's sustainable because each one of them is basically standing on top of the next person, um, or, or I don't know if standing on top, but you know, like basically each one is propping the other up. And so it makes it sustainable because you're not the only one there. It's not just one person, but everybody is kicking off of the other. And that's, the synchronicity is just beautiful. Beautiful, Ronnie. I love the imagery you just brought forward there. I have never looked at our logo and thought about it, of it as a windmill. Feels very generative. Thank you. Anyone else like to share? Maria. So what you were saying before that resiliency being all within us, right? So it takes that, something that is within us to tap into in order for us to heal. And then as we're healing and learning the pathways to that, we in turn will be able to help others and affect others in that process. So allowing or kind of communicating or to, um, sharing that that resilience is within all of us and to tap into because I don't think that people really feel like they do have that they don't feel like it's in us even though we know that it's in us like they're not knowing that it's within us and to use that tool in order to heal ourselves mm. yeah yeah it is really, um, I don't know if you have had that experience where you do your own work and then you go back into the world and you actually see immediately how it affects the world outside of you, not just in how you see it, but how you experience it, but then how then other people are experiencing you. And so just talking about, you know, how it is a continual and inter interdependent uh, web mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Let's jump to our online audience and see what they have to share on how resiliency is a tool for healing and creating just loving, sustainable conditions. Janine said, energetically, we can all impact each other's resiliency threshold. Knowing that we can recover and heal, we are open, not fearful of engaging in life again, trusting others. We also know that others can heal too. That is a beautiful thing to bring out as well. It's when when we go through our own experience, we hold a different perspective in knowing what's possible for others. 
And I think that then brings in a whole level of um, empathic com compassion. And when we experience uh, someone else who may be in their own trigger or pain, we are able to hold and understand what they might be going through and respond differently to them, creating a, a definitely a much more loving container, which really just helps us continue to spiral because as, as we then become that place of regulation or compassion for someone else, their nervous system can then feel and resonate with them. And it, you know, kind of just keeps on going. It is a gift that keeps on giving. Let's go on to our next question. Thank you all for continuing with us in this discussion. This next question we have, for somatic practice and transformation to happen in groups, consent needs to be present for everyone. Why is this important? So again, for somatic practice and transformation to happen in groups, consent needs to be present for everyone. Why is this important? Karen. Consent is super important because if the group has multiple trauma survivors in there, they're, during their trauma, they didn't have the option of providing consent for whatever reason. You know, they might've been too young um, or they may have um, experiencing the fight, flight, freeze or fawn or dissociating. So we do the best work whenever we do anything in therapy or group work is to make sure people feel heard and that they have choices. And providing consent is like the, the very basic first step in having your choices. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm really stoked that consent has made its way into um, to being at the forefront of a lot of communities now and uh, a lot of trauma-informed movement bringing that up to really allow people to realize how important it is to have that layer first of choice. So yeah, thank you for that, Karen. It's just very empowering too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and you know, I, I think there's also something beautiful and when you are the person um, to ask, there is something that also happens in our own energy where we then have to step into the place of letting go of what it is that we might have wanted from the outcome. And even in that, it helps us to arrive in a place that is truly um, allowing and also making sure that there is an equalizing of, of any unseen power dynamics. Thanks, Karen. Holly? Yeah, I totally agree with, and just echo what you, you and Karen both said about power dynamics and consent for me is really acknowledging that every person is the expert in their own life and that and that they are the only one who can know what is right for them by connecting with their own soma. And just consent, I, I, I like to facilitate groups and ask people, please listen for the resonance in any exercise I might suggest for whether this is right for you or not. And please, please be empowered to do something different. And that just, to me, just the idea of consent makes us awake. It, it, you know, we can't sort of like coast through life and just, you know, it, it requires us to be connected, which, you know, is healing for trauma, right? Trauma happens in disconnection and healing happens in connection. So I'll speak for myself. If I'm going to decide to consent as a part of a group and be really conscious about where is my yes? Where is my no? Where is my maybe? That makes me connected with myself and actually having a more authentic relationship with those people around me, which serves everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I think also speak, speaking to that is um, having the ability to know what your, your yeses and nos and maybes are and that that in and of itself can be quite difficult. And um, that there are people who have experienced different types of traumas where being able to tune into what they um, want uh, can be dysregulating. And so, yeah, I, I feel like even even speaking to, to that nuance, um, a big part of, of healing is important. And there's a complete, as you just said, healing trajectory to even approach that place because we know that 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 could be years, you know, and, and as we said earlier, you know, certain people have been encouraged to have a yes and a no, and, and certain people have been denied and prohibited legally and in other ways from having agency of a yes and a no. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Holly. Susan? Just really briefly, uh, if we're looking at safety, dignity, and belonging, um, all three, you have to have, I mean, if those aren't just personal, I don't think they can be, I think they have to be social, um, consent is necessary for all three of those and for them to coexist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for bringing that into the lens with all three. Ronnie? Yeah, I mean, I love how Holly brought up the, the yes, no, maybe. I mean, uh, I, I have two daughters, and uh, when when the first one was about two years old, and I was preparing her for the world, I would always tell her, um, I would always ask her, "Can I, can Daddy hold your hand?" And I started ingraining that in her mind that you know she has the opportunity to say yes, no, or or maybe. Um, but the author actually says something really interesting: consent being for our protection. And when I when I think about you know holding my daughter's hand, I think of it as another P. I think of it as partnership, right? So one of the things I did somatically, right, is I will hold up my hand and I'll put up one finger, and she will put her thumb next to mine, and I'll put the second finger, and she will put it up to mine, right? And so we get all the way to like five fingers, and there's that level of synchronicity there and uh, reciprocity that I don't think that we could do if I was just talking to her. Right. If I was just on Zoom, you know, I, I guess we could put it next to the camera or, what, you know, I, but you think about those people who, who, who really can align their timing, you know, one, two, three, four, and five. And I, and I taught her to speak in five languages, right? But the thing is that if you can do that in different things, not just in one, two, three, four, five, but even words or ideas, concepts, that, Consent can be a very beautiful partnership. Wow. Thank you for sharing that exercise, Ronnie. That's really wonderful. Did that exercise come, was that created because you wanted to mirror that to her and create a container which she's bringing that level of consent and awareness into her body? Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of work with culture and language. And so being able to teach her how to say one through 10 in five languages um, was, was really helpful for her cognitively, but somatically getting her to um, know how to control her body, right? Because when you're an infant, and I started my career working with uh, children diagnosed with ASD, being able to even just get one thumb out, right? And touch the thumbs together or, you know, and then like slowly or even counting to five, but using not just like in this order, but in different orders. And then you have one here and you got, you know, another finger is two. And then it starts increasing their imagination. And Bessel always talks about, you know, trauma being a, um, a problem with your imagination. So getting her to really think about things in different ways, again, is not just, um, encouraging her to to do what I want her to do, but get her to think about what how can she express herself, and that speaks a lot of what we're talking about. Oh, beautiful! Thank you, Maria. So, uh, giving permission often um, traumatized people are not given that opportunity to give consent, right? When we're traumatized, we are not given that opportunity. 
we are not giving consent to anything. Okay. So when we do have that opportunity, when we're given and when we're asked, it's first validating that we're important enough to elicit that permission. And second of all, it creates a uh, value and acceptance of all of us. Like, I see you, you matter, you're important. And what you, um, what you give or not give, permission, not permission, maybe is, uh, all of that is acceptable and important. And it gives a message of value that you are a valued person. Thank you for that. The uh, inherent signaling to someone else just by asking and giving consent. Yeah. Star. Thank you. While, while Karen was sharing, I, I went back into, I guess, the, the footnotes, right? And understanding how um, survival, what we do in survival mode versus uh, resiliency. Um, sometimes we don't even know that we're operating out of that place or survival mode. We don't really understand that, um, oh, I'm doing this to protect myself. I'm doing some things just to make sure that, again, consent is a protection method. It is to help us understand our boundaries, what boundaries are there for us. And we are, we have been, um, for those that have been oppressed, have been conditioned not to speak up, not to say anything, just let things run over you. But I like the fact that Stacy addresses all of these different ins and outs of <laughs> of what we how how our survival sh not only shapes us but um, helping other individuals understand um, our process of being better, um, getting to that next level of of uh, development in that resiliency or um, really understanding who we are. She talks about trust and the steps in how the three components of trust, intent, um, competency, and reliability. Those, if, if we don't, if we can't operate in that place, I can't trust you. <laughs> I can't speak those words that I wanna speak. And maybe the other part about it is that are you going to be able to receive it in the way that I'm intending it to be received? Um, so, you know, it, it, there's, yeah, this, these chat, these few chapters were phenomenal. So <laughs> thank you, Star. Yeah. And, and, and bringing consent in, I feel like is a piece of, is an important piece of, of trust as well. Cause if you can feel like, um, people are truly there and there is space for both people to, uh, be stepping in, uh, willingly, then there's an energetic about, about what's created there between two people. Thank you. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to our next question. But before we do that, let's check in with our virtual audience. So we have Janine sharing, uh, consent is important because people need that safe space to share within a group experience. Consent equals compassion for the sharing of people's lived experience. And Veronica says, choice, feeling heard promotes the necessary need to feel safe in the group. Thank you, Veronica and Janine. Okay, we'll move on to what will be our last question. And this is a Really good and meaty one, so um, saved it for last. What is the difference between shame and guilt and how can guilt be useful for driving accountability and change? So what is the difference between shame and guilt and how can guilt be useful for driving accountability and change? one of these emotions that we all like to talk about, shame. And Stacey talks about, you know, one of the key characteristics of shame is that it likes to hide and that therefore doing work with someone else when it comes to shame is really important because it likes to hide. So what is the difference between shame and guilt? 
Ronnie, brave soul, putting your hand up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that this is such an important topic um, because in our culture in North America, it's very much focused on guilt. But the predominantly vast majority of the world is more shame cultures. And so guilt essentially is how do we feel about what we did? Am I personally responsible for something that didn't go well? And so it's very individualistic. Um, shame, on the other hand, is very collect collectivistic. It's how do I, how am I seen or not seen, or can, should I even be seen uh, by others? So it's a very social concept. Uh, in terms of how do you drive accountability? Um, from where I come from, repentance, the idea of, you know, feeling guilty, but then being encouraged to do something different is very important. And that's the first step. And a lot of people who work with um, people suffering addictions, um, behavioral or substance, I think that motivation is key. So the, the guilt is the first step. But if you don't have any hope beyond the guilt, then, then that can be overly uh, burdensome. So it's very important. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that, Ronnie. That piece around um, guilt is, is an area that can lead towards new action and even meaning, different meaning. And um, I, I, it's interesting. I, I think she points out in the book that with shame, it's, you know, this general sense that we're wrong uh, or bad, or um, there's this deep, yeah, that's deep hidden feeling that something's wrong with us. And that if it's seen, we'll be cast out. And so there's that piece around no longer belonging. And so shame kind of being this thing that we, we feel like it's going, we, we disconnect um, versus guilt. Can, can that be a thing that actually leads us to create new meaning? Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. Holly? Since she draws us so much back to the body, you know, my felt sense of shame versus guilt is very different. So a felt sense of shame for me might look like I just don't want to inhabit this being. Um, there is a sense of I am wrong versus my actions and guilt actually has to acknowledge for me my goodness to know that you know I wasn't acting out of my integrity my inherent goodness present and guilt can actually be very positive in that way because I want to restore connection again here we are with trauma and connection and if I acknowledge and own my guilt, for me, there's this, it, it's, you know, painful for my ego, but there's actually this sense of relief because I'm coming back home to myself and saying, you know, I missed the mark. I really missed the mark there. Or I caused harm and I feel bad about that. And there's something that brings wholeness in that we often you know we just want to, our society like wants to push away anything that doesn't feel good but that's that's not good in my opinion you know I it's necessary for us to to make living amends to ourselves and to each other to feel the sting of like wow I was completely biased short-sighted etc. Um, how can I do better? But not how can I fundamentally be better? Um, I take that as a given. And so, like people have said, you know, action, action and reflection and being willing to sit in that discomfort. You know, we are so quick to say, I want to forgive. Mm. So many studies have shown that that's not super helpful. There's actually a reason we go through a process. And um, 
So I just think there's so much wisdom if we can return to the body in a, in examining both shame and guilt. At least for me, that's where that's where all of it's landed. Thank you, Holly. Appreciate that place on the really quick to want to get to the forgiving. <laughs> just trying to hop hop over there. And oftentimes I think when we try and get there too quick, we realize, oh, we missed a couple of steps. <laughs> Susan? Yeah, I so appreciated everything that, that Holly just said. Um, I, I wanna take it in the other direction though, to Emu, cause you went straight to the body. And I think um, the distinction she draws between shame and guilt is also so much a part of her argument about structural trauma. And who, who gets shamed and why do they get shamed? There's a South African writer um, and academic, Pumla Dineokola, and my clicks aren't good. Um, but she, she in, in one of her books about the kind of epidemic of sexual violence in South Africa, she says, if you look at who gets shamed in a society, it tells you so much about who that society is offloading its own shame on. And she gives the example of, you know, the poor people are, ashamed of their poverty and yet that poverty is structurally produced and reproduced and compounded and um so when Stacey Haynes gives the example of the I think she was a Filipina domestic laborer who was 76 and hadn't seen her own children since they were sort of pre-teens and had never seen her grandchildren and and she just goes through this list of all the things that this woman feels ashamed about and none of that, well, she had been sexually assaulted as a child. Um, she had been, she had got into trouble because she was undocumented. Um, she felt terrible shame about not being there for her family. All of those things were utterly structurally produced. So I think that we, like, we have to kind of keep, I think what Stacey Haynes does so brilliantly, I sound like a broken record, but is kind of keep us in balance between the body, the way that, that, that we are living this in somatic ways and the way that the culture and the structural traumas around us are reproducing harm all the time. And I think that, that the way that shame kind of manifests is so much a part of structural trauma. Mm, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, shame within our society. Hmm. Holly? Oh, you, <laughs> you didn't have anything else to share. Star, did I see that your hand was up or did you put that down? I did put it up and I'm like, I, I feel like I'm, as I, well, no, I feel like I'm talking too much and I don't want to talk too much, but but I am going to share this, right? <laughs> healing and guilt. She says by healing our shame, not well, healing our shame is it, it allows for hope. Beautiful, right? Guilt is a focus on behaviors that we know we can change. There's the serenity prayer. What is it? Uh, um, God grant us the, the serenity to accept the things we cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it's holding yourself accountable and responsible for everything you put out in this world. I heard uh, recently, what are we doing with the, the given time we have here on earth? Mm -hmm. If it is just a waddle in our, in our shame, in our guilt, are we really giving ourselves do a justice, right? Are we are we doing that in in a way just to self pity parties, or are we doing it just for the? Um... Yeah, I'm done. It's a lot more. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I it actually you touched upon something that um, I thought was really interesting. A part that stood out for me when she talks about shame, which is like she talks about the shame trampoline and um, we're just like bouncing and it's uh, just continually kind of going, continually trying to distract actually from what's underneath, you know, shame is continually dist distracting by keeping our attention on, oh, this thing is wrong with me. Uh, this thing is wrong with me instead of, really looking at underneath and and she talked actually about how that is giving us some 
trying to have us have some sense of power at, oh, this is my fault. And so with that, it makes it so that we feel like we still have power over what's happening. And that that part like really hit me strongly um, when she brought that up because I was thinking, oh yeah, well that that then feels good. So then of course, um, you're what we will keep using shame to try and perpetuate that so that we can feel like we're in control, but that it'll just end up being a distraction. Whereas, yeah, maybe with guilt, there's something else that brings about action. <sighs> All right. Any last thoughts about shame and guilt? I mean, these are really, uh, Naima, I was hoping you would share with us. You just have to unmute. What about anger? Uh, I like to 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 talk about anger with with my with my audience um, because there is also this this shame about being angry at something not uh, appropriate. Um, socially accepted and um i found anger amazing driver for change as well um in a sense that we have the choice it is a massive energy that we as uh, in the trauma context abusive context you cannot express so it's self-destructive if he's still is stuck in a body, that's when somatic at the first stage of the recovery is paramount to bring up this energy that we've been shoving for so long in the nervous system and harness it. And once we are well grounded in our self care, then is a moment where we can transmute this strong energy toward the collective, the community. So, from a des destructive uh, energy, this anger actually becomes very creative and beneficial for the collective. So it's not something to deny, it's not something to hide, it's not something to uh, re repress. And there is this problem in the society with anger that is, 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 um, is not a good energy to have. So in my, in my practice, in my somatic practice, um, I work a lot with, with anger um, is very important to address because it's amazing energy to use uh, for for social change. Thank you, Naima, so much for bringing us home and bringing that in. Really appreciate the nod to anger and the importance of working with that as an emotion. Well, to close us out, I'll just share some from our online audience. Um, Janine shared, I believe the difference between shame and guilt is that shame feels like a stain on my soul of wrongness. It's hard to move past with it being interwoven with trauma. Guilt feels like a heavy coat, a parka that I wear because growing up feeling guilty feels familiar, like home in my trauma mind. Thank you for those analogies. And uh, Alison said, guilt is I have done something wrong versus shame is I am wrong. Yeah, it's a nice, sim simple way to approach it. Well, we are just uh, past the half hour mark. And so that means it is time for us to wrap up our book club for today and thank all of our amazing panelists for joining us from all over the world and also people who are in our virtual community for also joining us and to thank the TRF team who is all behind the scenes working to put this wonderful production together so that 
we can all come together weekly and come and discuss and have conversation as a community because we know working through and reading these books can be difficult. Um, it's definitely not an easy breezy read. So thank you all for finding the consented yes within your body to uh, move through all of the wisdom and knowledge that Stacy has to share with us. We will be back again, same time, same place next week. And then we will have a break for Thanksgiving week. And then that week after, we are very excited to welcome Stacy in with us. And we hope you all come and join and bring your questions because um, it will just be such an honor to um, be in that space and conversation with her. So thank you all so much. I hope you all take some rest, uh, hydrate, come into your body, maybe write out and revisit your declarations. And we will see you next week. Take care.